Today, I'm going to talk with you about how to build restorative cities. That's new cities and redeveloping existing cities. And we're going to look at it through the perspective of infrastructure, and which touches the physical and the non-physical infrastructure, and the components that affect our economies, and consequently the way um, we live. A little bit about myself to begin with. Um, I'm born and raised in Iceland. I spent some years in Europe, and for the past 16 years, I lived in Minneapolis in the United States of America. I worked there, and my entire career I spent kind of making the business case for green, sustainability, figuring out what it means to companies, to cities, to people, and um, you, you start discovering a few things. So I built global supply chains of sustainable products, um, developed water infrastructure projects for, for nations. I uh, worked with green and started to figure out what, what is green. So over the years, you learn a few things about what works and what doesn't work. And um, I think to put it all into perspective, um, let's discover what green is once and for all. You know, and maybe in a couple of minutes we understand why companies are called greenwashers and why it's so hard to be green. And if we pay attention to the center line through this graph, so this graph explains six phases of green. These are shades of green, if you like to call it that. But uh, the center line is sustainability, it's neutrality. And if you heard the, the concept of the race to zero, that's where we're heading with the race to zero. Um, Zero means, in business terms, that we're breaking even, we're not making profit. Uh, the world today, our infrastructure, our cities, our companies, the, as people, because what the grid provides, we operate in the conventional space. We're a step above exploiting everything. But we're going to ex explore also that anything below the zero line is exploitation. And wh what it means, um, when we work in a conventional space, we're under the zero point means our infrastructure, our cities, our companies, is we're oper operating on negative assets and it's costly. And when we look at what is green, we're, we're taking an incremental step up from uh, the conventional level. And um, if I'm going to say I'm green and you, you start recognizing me over time as the greenest guy you ever met, but I'm an absolute jerk. Do you care if I'm green? You know, it doesn't matter. And this is a cause of greenwashing, the number one cause of greenwashing. And we have, at the green level, we have environmental cost. At the conventional level, we have envi environmental cost. But we have huge cost of social infrastructure as well. We have poverty. And we, it means we are exploiting the earth, our ecosystems. We are exploiting people, our social structure. And the economy is paying for it. And this is the cycle that the Earth is operating on and has been operating on for a long time. And the race to zero is our, our <laughs> argument. Is it's not enough to, to get to zero because we're just breaking even. It means we're sustaining um, life as, as our standard of living as it is right now. At the same time, we haven't fixed the problem. We're still abusing the Earth. We haven't fixed the Earth. We haven't fixed our social systems. We haven't fixed poverty. And... Um, we need to get into the um, positive space. And as my good friend and, and our business partner, Joshua Foss says, um, Björgwin, I'm gonna punch you on the nose today, and, uh, but I'm gonna do it 30% lighter than I did last week. And, and then we're gonna study how beneficial it was for you. <laughs> you know, this is in a nutshell what operating under the zero point is like. And the opposite happens when we pass, surpass the zero point and we go into the restorative space. So restorative space is where we found the way to create an asset out of polluted water. Polluted water is water that is an operating as a negative asset, comes with cost. Health costs, because you know, in our, so in our health infrastructure, our health system is paying for it. Same with uh, air. Um, all of our resources, how we use our resources. And so we go into the, the restorative space and we have turned everything into a positive asset. And we're going to look into how cities, how conventional cities are operating as far as the infrastructure concerns. But when I talk about infrastructure today, it's, um, it's not the traditional way of roads and bridges as we think of infrastructure, airports, but it's specifically 
two env um, energies, waste, water, IT, our internet infrastructure, a key component in, uh, in our economy, and food, the infrastructure of food. So current cities, you look, see the, the city is there in the middle. And now see how we take everything. Um, we truck and haul our waste to a faraway source, usually regional landfills or sometimes to another country. This is a resource we're shipping out of our economy. Um, water. We use the water and we pipe it long distances to a treatment plant which treats it um, to a certain level and then dumps it into the ocean. Gone. Everything we do, our food, it just goes into, you know, a lot of it goes into waste. Everything we use, the energy, waste, water, we use it one time and we throw it away. And um, so this is not a good, good use. This is a very dysfunctional model. It's very expensive and uh, there is a better way to do it. And um, so what we propose is a restorative city. It's basically the, op the opposition. It's a contrast of what we're how we're doing it today. We're going to take all these key components, energy, waste, water, IT, and the food infrastructure, and we're going to put it into a single system. This is one grid that operates the entire infrastructure. And you can imagine the amount of pipes and the resilience, the, the pipes you get rid of, and the resilience that you create within your city when you have it in a single system. The ease of government, the ease of management, and the cost savings, tremendous cost savings. And when we buy into this restorative vision, when we understand what it delivers, um, we can realize an economy uh, because the restorative vision means this city is um, processing the waste within the city, in, 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 a, in a facility within the city, turning it into valuables, into energy, recyclable goods, and uh, efficiently eliminating the need for landfills. Um, what does that mean, really? La the Earth is running out of space for landfills. Our land is too valuable. And, and this system gets rid of landfills. We don't need them. Water is used within the city. It's not transported out of the city. It's treated to a potable level within the city. And if we don't want to drink it, the, the, the poop from yesterday, <laughs> we can use it for industrial use, irrigation, but this is using technology instead of process in, in the old model, in the current model. And, but this is water that we can now use uh, very efficiently within the city. And uh, so you start realizing waste is a resource and, and it's, it's not waste anymore. This con uh, converts the way we think about um, our infrastructure. And let's see what it can look like in a, in within the city. Um, the image, that we call it the city hub and the city grid. Um, it's a single facility which processes all these key components. And we, we, we discussed a little bit how energy and waste and water is done in a single system and now in a single building within the city. And the grid is how it distributes these goods to the people. And this is undoubtedly a model of a 21st century utility system. And this single building is not just this incredible hub of technologies and infrastructure. It sends out an uh, IT signal for, for our internet connections that is 1,000 times faster that th than is conventional today. We're, it's in the gigabytes per second, not megabytes per second. And all technologies are market proven. They're cutting edge, but they are market proven. And very importantly, the internet, to have a powerful internet as a part of this infrastructure is that it, it, it enables a smart city, an intelligent city. And a smart city is one that measures uh, our energy water use specifically, but it allows the city to, to communicate so that we're not wasting our energy and water, our valuable resources. And there is another thing that this building does. It has a social factor as well. It connects with the 
with the community. And it does that bec uh, through education classrooms. So school districts and nonprofit organizations have a place there to carry out their missions. Uh, the classrooms, the school districts, why is that important? Um, a lot of children are unfortunate. They don't eat every day and, and consequently their test scores may be lower or, or very low or none. <coughs> this has a ripple effect on their lives and their communities. And in this building, they have access to learn about cutting edge technologies, how our infrastructure works, how the city works, um, modern type agriculture, this building, a medium-sized building like this, we're, we're talking about 600 tons of waste a day, municipal solid waste, processing all the waste water. This building at this size creates enough seafood, say 200 to 250 tons of fish a day through aquaponics, uh, uh, in a year, excuse me, and, and an equal amount of vegetables. So this is enough food to feed tens of thousands of people every year with all the vegetable and fish needs. This is organic, locally produced uh, um, vegetables and fish. So they have an opportunity, the kids have an opportunity to learn about this, to participate in the harvesting and the processing of these products. Uh, another way here is innovators in, in the community have a platform to test out their innovations. Um, there are some barriers. Well, there are some barriers. <laughs> Let's let's look at the regulatory ones to be you know first. And those would be that the regulatory system favors the incumbent over the new guy. And um, how how does that work? It's pretty much impossible in the world to change the model because politicians are not willing or able to go with the new guy to go with innovation. And and oftentimes it's plain and simply illegal to be green or sustainable, not to mention restorative. But um, also a part of the political spectrum here is um, a lot of regions in the world have in a way painted themselves in a corner a long time ago because they offer um, energy, uh, low energy prices and under cost water prices and under cost waste management prices to businesses as a part of their economic development policies. And when they've done that, it becomes impossible to raise these prices. And this is a cost burden which the economy, in a way, doesn't, can't afford anymore. And this is why that has a ripple effect down on our social system. So this is the cycle we're stuck in. Um, e economically, uh, money goes where money is, in a way. It's hard to change its path. The market itself is the very decision makers um, have to be brave. You know, it's not the innovator who is the hero or is, is the game changer. A lot of people come out with a lot of good ideas, but it's the very people, I think we know this, it's the very client, it's the very, you know, it's the decision makers that are willing to step out of their comfort zone to make these things happen. I, I think we all agree that what we talk about today is possible. It's just about doing it and, and inspire the decision makers to, to go with it. Uh, how do we overcome the barriers? Maybe with money, huh? One of these city hubs actually creates profit in its first year and it pays its own mortgage and interest payments. It happens to be very profitable. And I can say that with comfort because for years we spent time creating partnerships in in energy, wastewater, IT, food production. So we work with the world's best and we are reporting accurate num numbers. Um, the system is profitable, it means it's doable. I it fits within the, the kind of core, core, core thing that, that a city needs is that infrastructure has to be profitable because cities don't have money anymore to build. So this can be done with private capital. The economic effect of one city hub in the first year is $60 million and then figure out the, the tax money that comes from that within the community, all of a sudden the city realizes, hmm, we have, we have new money here. Maybe we can build our roads with that money. And at the same time as we're realizing this new economy, we're getting rid of the money that the city is spending on energy, wastewater, IT infrastructures. So 
it's only a win-win in this situation. 10-year build-out, regional build-out, and this is for a market of, an average market in the world, we figured about 3 million people. Um, the economic effect of building uh, city hubs for a region creates in the first year $6 billion of new money that we are not shipping out to other regions in the world, you know, buying energy, uh, getting rid of waste, or getting, you know, water from, or, or, or IT, anything else. We are creating this local resilience, so this is new money within our market. And this is not counting the economic ripple effect. This is every dollar used one time. Um, that's all I got today, folks. Thank you, it's good to be in Gorensee. Appreciate it. <laughs>